Hello, everyone. My name is Christine Gorman, and this is the May 2nd meeting of Hell's Kitchen Democrats. Um, we're very excited uh, this month to have a guest speaker, uh, George F. Green um, from uh, the great Midwest. And um, he's going to tell us about uh, how to um, counter disinformation and misinformation. But before we do, uh, we have a couple of things um, to a couple of business uh, items that I've, I'm hoping to take care of in the next 15 minutes. Um, so uh, the first of which is uh, we haven't sent minutes around or anything uh, from our last meeting. So I think what we'll do is take care of the approving of minutes at our June meeting so um, uh, we can use um, as much time as possible for the presentation. Um, also a reminder that we're selling flowers on May 12th and 13th, and Stephanie, I'm sure would love to uh, hear from you um, uh, uh, to, uh, to help uh, person the booth, staff the booth, the table, I should say. I know, Heather, you have, um, uh, you're, you've put out a call for volunteers for the um, uh, Ninth Avenue Food Festival um, on the 18th and 19th. So uh, please be sure and uh, connect with her. Um, a couple of items of note uh, in the news. Um, as you probably all heard, the um, New York State Legislature and the governor uh, agreed on a budget with, uh, and as we know, and as I'll, I'm saying for George's benefit, um, a lot of legislation happens in New York through the budgeting process and not necessarily through passing of laws. <laughs> and um, it's it's the uh, non-transparent ways we sometimes have of doing things in, in New York. Uh, one of the biggest items that is of interest for um, folks in our area is the um, uh, the new tools that are uh, uh, now going to be available to um, uh, local authorities uh, to shut down unlicensed illegal weed shops, uh, which have been crowding out the um, the licensed ones and and making it hard for them to get off the ground. Um, We'll believe it when we see it. It's been two years that we've been uh, inundated with unlicensed weed shops. But the rumor is um, the uh, New York Police Department, NYPD, which had been legislated out of the process, is now getting some training from the Office of Cannabis Management and the sheriff um, to uh, padlock some of these unlicensed um, shops. Uh, the other big news, actually, there's a lot of news that's going on with um, redevelopment of um, the Port Authority and all of that. But the other one that our club is particularly interested in, I know, is the uh, vote on um, changing New York City zoning to allow um, uh, casinos that get a special license for um, New York City to build as of right and not to have to go through the our Euler process. Um, that was very controversial. Uh, Community Board 4 voted unanimously against that zoning text amendment. Um, our city council person voted for the zoning text amendment. And he's, I know he's been um, talking to a lot of folks about why. And I would like to um, uh, find out from you all if, if maybe we should invite him to our June meeting to, to have a discussion uh, about that. Um, I'm seeing nodding of heads. Is there a consensus? Thumbs up? OK, great. So I will communicate that to his chief of staff. Um, those are the things that I know of to tell the, the club. Is there anything else in the next uh, eight minutes? I told George that he could start at 7.15. Go ahead, Richard. 
I was just wondering if we want to have uh, a sooner meeting with Eric um, to uh, discuss that vote. A month's a long time from now. Yes, it is. Um, I, I do note, however, that the casino process has been delayed the state itself, it's, which is ironic because they said they had to change the zoning rules because in order not to lose time, and then the state turned around and, and delayed the application process. So um, I'm not sure we could get a meeting of everyone together before uh, our June meeting. But well, I'll see, I'll see and as you point out, it may not be necessary. The whole system may be slowing down, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything else to highlight before? Well, we're gonna uh, we're making great time. So, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to George. He has a about 45 minute presentation, and then uh, uh, has um, uh, it'll be open for questions and answers and and you know strategizing and next steps. Um, so uh, without further ado, George F. Green. Okay, and Christine, oh, can you enable sharing when you get a chance? I'll need it in a little bit. So I'm George Green, uh, actually born in New York. I lived in Hicksville as a kid in the 60s and ended up in, yeah, after a number of other places, in uh, right outside of Minneapolis, otherwise known as the Mini-Apple. People here have a secret desire to uh, be New Yorkers. It's really strange. But, uh, and uh, Minnesota, I've, I've been working all this week, like I'm sure you all have, on plenty of political things going on. I'm, uh, uh, I was a former CD chair, and now I'm heading the nominations committee. We've had meetings all week, uh, every night, and we've been interviewing people. And then uh, our congressional district convention is Saturday. So it's been a really crazy week around here. <laughs> so anyway, my, my, um, I spent a, a lot of time in, uh, in my career in media, uh, interactive multimedia when there was such a thing called that, and uh, television, television systems and production. Uh, but I also worked in psychology before that, and um, I've come back to that uh, now that I'm technically retired. And what I'm doing is uh, I, my colleague Antonia Scatton and I created the Turnaround Project, which is a, uh, it's uh, where we do framing and messaging workshops that we call How to Make More Democrats. And we do this for state parties through the DNC's Association of State Democratic Committees, which is basically the group of all the chairs and vice chairs and uh, EDs. And, uh, and, uh, it's, and our state chair here in Minnesota, Ken Martin, happens to also be the chair of that group and is a uh, DNC vice chair. And Ken is, it, it, Minnesota is a pretty cool place. We, um, we have all the statewide offices and a trifecta, yeah, you know, or and the rest of the trifecta, which is the House and the uh, Senate. And so our governor said the thing I've been waiting to hear for a long time, this time we're spending our political capital, <laughs> which I thought was great. So good things have been happening here in Minnesota. And um, we have a very functional state party and talking to the other party chairs around the country, uh, it's amazing how many parties, there are no paid employees except the executive director. Uh, they have very few volunteers. Uh, some of them, ha they have virtually no money. It's, it's I, I find it hard to believe, but uh, so we do these workshops. We're extremely reasonably priced for the state so that it's been working out. So uh, it's kind of fun. So what I've tried to do is kind of boil some of that down and, and give you some of it. Uh, I do need to speak for a moment about my colleague, Antonia. Um, Antonia Scatton worked with George Lakoff. Some of you here look like you've been around almost as long as I have. And you may have read Don't Think of an Elephant a long time ago. Anybody re read that? One? Okay. Uh, anyway, George Lakoff is a linguist, cognitive scientist, and he's the guy back in 2004 that was beating on the Democratic Party to uh, stop using whatever method it is that we use for messaging and actually look at the psychology behind how people think. Uh, Antonia worked with George Lakoff for a while, and um, a lot of what we have in our big workshop is uh, 
uh, the result of that work. Antonia is hands down the very best person we have at Messaging Science right now. I'm fortunate to work with her. Her substack is called Reframing America, and I'm going to put the um, if I can find the chat here. I'm going to put the uh, URL in the chat. Do that to everyone. Oh, I can't do it to everyone. Oh, it's going to you, Christine. But it's in the chat. And uh, highly recommended if you want a, 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 a semi-regular uh, uh, guidance on messaging. This is the best thing that's out there. I, uh, that's one of the reasons I partnered with her. because She's top-notch. Anyway, uh, getting around to this, when Christine contacted me, she asked specifically about how we can counter misinformation. I'm going to phrase that a little differently to put it in a broader perspective. How do we counter a lavishly financed 50-year propaganda campaign that spreads misinformation so effectively? And 50 years ago, Republicans set out to achieve their prime directive of concentrating wealth and power in the hands of a small number of people, while at the same time undoing citizens' power to stop them. And you see how far they've gotten in that, in that, uh, in that way. And so I'm going to share my screen, and we'll get some of this going here. There we go. All right. We called it How to Make More Democrats. So Republicans, knowing that their plan might be unpopular, they resolved to be stealthy, and as all autocrats do, they used well-known propaganda techniques to create what I call FUD, a takeoff on food that people have seen before, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and distraction. Propaganda is psychology, so they studied very carefully the rapidly advancing sciences of cognition, linguistics, and behavioral economics to learn how the brain actually works. This is all the same stuff, all the same psychology that's used in marketing, so it's not really a big surprise. Uh, they felt and feel no shame in misleading people. Quite the contrary, they believe that to this day they deserve to have this power and that we don't. And tragically for democracy, they succeeded far beyond their expectations. So Democrats could have countered this by using some psychology of our own, but alas, that's not what happened. For messaging, we basically just wing it. You, you, you guys are all local activists, and you know what it's like grabbing the walk sheets and the crappy scripts and trying to make the best of it. I mean, we basically say whatever sounds good because few of us have been trained in messaging. And... Uh, and nationally, we say whatever the, the consultants tell us to say. And if any of that had actually worked, we would not be barely breaking even with people who believe in Jewish space laser. I mean, seriously. You know, how in the world is our messaging in such a state that we can't do better than break even with those guys? Uh, it's crazy. So, I mean, in effect, we, ironically, have been the science deniers, and this has cost us. Um, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to read this quote from George Lakoff. I highly re recommend Don't Think of an Elephant. It's an interesting book. The whole challenge of Don't Think of an Elephant is that I'm telling you not to think of an elephant, and I have lit up the brain cells in your head about elephants. You're seeing pictures of elephants. You're thinking about elephants' graveyards, how they take care of their kids, and they run around in their, or well, or lumber about in their, on the savannah and all of the stuff you know about elephants, even though I told you not to think about that. The words that we use light up brain cells in our heads outside of the context of the sentence. So that's important. Uh, this quote by George Lakoff, uh, all politics are moral politics and people act in line with their moral identities, not because they agree with a list of policies. If progressives lose the future, it will not be due to a lack of good policy ideas. If we lose the future, ceding democracy to authoritarians or bad corporate actors, it will be due mostly to a stunning failure to communicate with people in simple language that connects them on the level of their moral values. And it will be due to a stubborn rejection of tried and true scientific methods of mass communications, methods that conservatives have repeatedly deployed to winning effect. And um, uh, this is our situation. It is not, it is not uh, unsolvable, though, and that's one of the reasons that we are doing this. And uh, we, the Lake Office is still an advisor. Drew Weston, the, the guy who wrote Political Brain, 
and a um, number of other people, uh, Rachel Bickoff, where people know about the stuff we're doing, and everybody is saying finally somebody's doing it. So, and there are a few other groups doing this, um, the uh, Research Collaborative uh, with uh, uh, Manat Shankar Osario is doing this, and um, and uh, only a, one or two other groups. Uh, so, anyway, but we can fix it. Let's um, let's fit, uh, take a look here. Um, well, first off, what I want to do, we have a short time, so I'm not going to be able to go into everything, but I hope to tantalize you with enough new concepts that you'll want to know more. We, we also have online workshops uh, coming up. We're going to probably do our three-hour workshop online coming in probably July, it looks like. And uh, you can also check out Antonia's Substack, which I gave you the link for. Uh, okay, so how do we fix this? Well, we have to unlearn some bad habits before we can learn better ways of making more Democrats. And we need to look at just a little bit about what frames are and framing. Uh, so, first off, um, uh, that uh, this is literally true. Ideas are physical. Everything you know, every everything that you've experienced, all of your knowledge, your skills, uh, your feelings, all of that stuff lives inside actual real physical brain cells. It's electrochemical stuff going on in there. And this is important to know because that physical system works in precise ways, well, in precise ways, which are mostly opaque to us but 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 there are things that 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 we do understand about them and one of that one of that is is, is neurons interconnect with each other and frames frames could be to your understanding of uh, how to ride a bike or bicycles in general or uh, parts of bicycles or other things that that are transportation things. All these frames are interconnected neural structures and put together, it helps you understand how the world works. And so, uh, and these and these connections between these ideas living in actual cells, uh, they get strengthened through repetition. And if things aren't being used, they get weakened. I mean, we can still remember stuff from our childhood. My sister tells me stuff I forgot years ago. And I'm going, oh, yeah. I mean, it's in there. But most of the time, the stuff that comes to mind is what's been repeated the most and which we're currently thinking about. So um, frames can be thought of as a container that holds all of what you know about something. It can also be thought of as a point of view or a perspective, a way to understand something. Uh, context. How an idea fits together with others. A frame also uh, has boundaries. Some things belong in the frame, some things don't. If I was flying in New York and I'm sitting next to a, a shark and the shark says you're going to eat those peanuts, uh, there's something wrong with that story because sharks don't fly on planes, right? So, it, you know, the, the frame you've chosen there uh, has boundaries. And uh, they're frequently also stories. A story is kind of a whole idea especially fables and um, uh, and such uh, have moral lessons to them and it's all bound up in a story a nice little lead package that you can remember um, so frames are stories let's look at it from that perspective and in stories you have actors and roles and scenes where they take place and scenarios interactions between the the uh, the actors and the and the scene actually and so let's take a look at um, at the at the, the conservative way of viewing immigrants. It's a crime frame. In the crime frame, immigrants are, are illegal. They come across the border. They're committing crimes. Uh, Trump obviously, literally, uh, decides that he's going to refer to them as uh, as uh, 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 rapists and murderers and gang members and you know any manner of uh, horrible creatures and uh, so when we talk with conservatives about this and we allow them to stay in that frame it gets very difficult for us to get our messages across uh, conversely if we were to say you know we took, chose a frame I'm just picking a good one here that works is that if anybody knows anything about this situation the word that describes these people are refugees. What does it take for people to grab the kids by the hand and walk 1,500 miles? They're leaving their family, their homes, their church, their business, their community. They're walking with the kids to a very dangerous border crossing. Well, what, who, who does that? 
The only people who do that are people who are scared uh, or are, are desperate or in desperate poverty. They're refugees. In the refugee frame, think about what happens here. The villains are not the refugees. The villains are the people who are, have no empathy or compassion for these folks and are taking their children, putting them in cages and disappearing them uh, to, uh, apparently I read about some Christian, far-right Christian families adopting them as servants. Um, whatever. Uh, so the whole dynamic changes, the whole story changes, the victims, the heroes um, uh, are the, uh, uh, that all changes, and the, and the villains, that all changes depending on the frame you choose. Okay, so um, we, we do tactical communication as Democrats. This is kind of what we do. Uh, we we handle the situation right in front of us right now for this cycle, for this candidate and this issue. There's really not any thinking uh, beyond that for any strategic communication. How, how are we going to win over the long term? Republicans are great at this. Their, all of their messaging uh, serves uh, both purposes, the, the tactical and the strategic. And in strategic, what what the Republicans do is they expose people to, to their moral values so they'll use their perspectives when they consider the issues. And, um, and, they, and they do this in virtually every message. If you listen to what they I mean, except for the, the crazy conspiracy stuff, but you can generally find their moral values in a lot of their messages. It's not something that we do, which is, I find surprising. Uh, and so this is one of the things we have to solve. We have to have strategic messaging that takes longer. That happens over many cycles and many uh, connections with voters. And, but it's something that we have to do. This is one of the reasons why we're breaking even with them, because we have not built the runway inside people's brains for our beliefs to land on when we get to the door. So we'll, we'll be talking more about that tonight. That's what our object is. Um, also, Every time we repeat their propaganda, especially to refute it, we help them propagate it. That is, that's a rather challenging con uh, concept, but this is, this is what's going on. You'll see more of this as we go on. Uh, have you ever wondered why MAGA messages seem like evil clickbait? This is on purpose. They're, they're trying to create controversy. They're trying to get attention. They want, they, they want us to respond. They demand. These kind of goofy things demand us to respond. And, of course, we oblige. We get all apoplectic. We bring out our facts and, you know, slap them with our impeccable logic. And, it, you know, nothing happens. It doesn't work. But the Republicans want us to argue with them because it lets them set the agenda or the frame of what gets talked about. It lets them set the frame, the story, the perspective of discussion, which restricts how it gets talked about. So they choose what gets talked about. They choose how it gets talked about with the boundaries that come with the frame. It intentionally, they intentionally provoke us into arguing with them and debunking because that amplifies their message. Uh, think about social media posts that you, say, that you see. A lot of us are paying like far too much attention to what's going on with Trump right now. And our, I would bet that many of our social media posts are along the lines of, did you hear the stupid thing Trump said today? Or his lawyer said, or somebody else. And then that, or, or you see a post and you comment on it. And when you comment on something, that can show up on your friends' pages uh, with, with the original article. So as we're sitting there complaining about Trump, we're generating this huge number of messages that go out that include the original message, therefore spreading that message. Now, you assume all your friends are liberals, but maybe they're not. Maybe you've just helped one of your conservative relatives to uh, a notion they may not have seen before. So it's important. So we do not want to amplify their message. And then, of course, the other big reason that they bait us like this is because it keeps us off our message. Every minute we're spending thinking about Trump, having him inhabiting our brain, uh, debunking these guys, arguing, complaining, whatever. All that time is time we're off our message. And this, this, is, this is something that we simply cannot afford to do anymore. So, obviously, the idea is don't take the bait. 
That's very important. Keep that in your mind. It's, it's, it's tough to do. I found it's easier when you turn off the television. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll, I'll read a little bit, but I, I, I found that I haven't missed much important by not watching the news. It's reduced my stress levels, but it also, I have brain time that's freed up to do other things now. I'm not reacting all stressed out about Trump getting away with stuff. I'm focusing on other things like you guys. You're more fun anyway. So there's that. The other thing is be us, not them. Talk about us all the time. That's what we need to spend our time on. Uh, whatever position you've taken on an issue, you've taken it because you understand what's right and wrong with the issue. You care about how the, official, the issue affects real people. Say what Democrats stand for at the moral level so people can use those values to reconsider the issue through that perspective. Give them that perspective. This, is, this turns out to be a lot easier for you and the voter than remembering all that wonky stuff. I mean, think about when you go to the door, you're, you know, you're, you're scared that you're going to, the voter's going to ask you something you don't know, and you're going to look like an idiot. What do you think the voter's thinking when you walk up to the door with a clipboard and, you know, bumper stickers pasted to your t-shirt? They're scared too. This is a hell of a way to start a conversation. So if you, but if you go to uh, morals, if you go to values, you know, why you care about something, and if you talk about real people and the effects of issues on real people, that's something anybody can have a conversation about. And now you have a conversation at the door that's easier, doesn't require a whole lot of training for your volunteers. If you can just get them to do that, things are going to go a little bit better. Tell people why you care. And so because all politics is moral. And if you take all our moral values that we have as Democrats, we'll talk about those in, in a moment. Uh, if you take them together, uh, what they are and how they interrelate, that's our worldview. And this is what we need to build into people's brains. Unfortunately, I've come to find out, including myself when I first started this, unfortunately, most liberals can't actually tell you what our worldview is. So I'm going to give it to you in the simplest form. We do go into this in much greater detail in the, our three-hour workshop. But uh, uh, we, we use a thing called stop, with, that we call stop, drop, and roll. roll. Uh, we want people to stop and think about what's going on, see what everybody's saying, uh, figure out what the Republican frames are so you don't use them, and figure out what our frame should be. Drop the stuff that doesn't work, like debunking and getting all wonky and uh, and jargon and things of that sort, and then roll with a well-framed message using values. So that's where the roll comes from. And in this, these values you see here, these are some, but these are these are the big ones. Uh, I, I, I personally believe our entire worldview is centered on empathy. And I actually like to use the word love in the agape sense. Uh, in that this, you know, we just, we care about our fellow, our fellow beings on this planet, whether they be human or otherwise. And, uh, and a lot of all of our other values will come out of that because, I mean, if we don't care about other people, then we really don't care about all these other things, you know, doesn't help. Uh, the next two, protection and empowerment on the liberal side, this is the role of government, protection and empowerment on the conservative side it's only protection uh, at least in their public in their public speaking of course the empowerment for them and they're perfectly t happy to have it is all the subsidies that go to the oil companies and the uh, and and other such corporate welfare that goes out but officially in their messaging they won't talk about that so for them it's just put protection and you, you see these other ones and investment in, uh, investment in progress. I think this is important for us to talk about along with the one at the bottom, public support for private success, because this is our business message. So when we're talking to business people, hey, you know what? We, we're just fine helping businesses out. You know, maybe not with everything, but you know, you don't have, you generally are not paying for the roads your goods are moving on. Uh, your executives aren't dropping out of the sky because the FAA makes sure things are in good shape. Uh, you have courts that hold, uphold your contracts. We do a lot 
for business. We even invest in particular businesses like uh, semiconductors in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. I think it's the Inflation Reduction Act. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing plenty. And so it is not true that we don't care about business or that we don't want to invest in it. And these others are, are should be pretty obvious. Uh, inter interdependence and inclusiveness is a one that's a big with a lot of the constituency groups that we have in the party now. So uh, you can work these words, these ideas, explicitly or implicitly, into your message. And let, let me give you an example here. Um, I'm going to start out with an issue. Oh, sorry. It's also way easier than facts and logic. Okay. The happy little picture. We're talking about education. Well, you can make a protection message. And that protection message is that uh, our country is safer when we have intelligent people, well-trained in, in science, technology, engineering, and math, and the arts, uh, and because they're just generally smarter people, that makes our country safer and also more prosperous. Empowerment. Think what education does for our kids if we do it right. I was a product of the New York school system up until junior high. It is very different than it is in the Midwest, I'll tell you that. That was a culture shock. But, um, uh, you know, I learned tremendous amounts. It was, it was amazing. It's, it's stuck with me, and that empowers me in, in, in uh, my life. Uh, it's an investment in our future. It's an investment in our communities. It's fair. Public education is for everybody. It's fair. So right there on one issue, I've used four of the values that we have. I know what people might be saying. No, no, no. We need a magic bumper sticker. We only need one thing that we're going to say. We can't do that. Well, the magic bumper, bumper sticker doesn't exist. It's a myth. And it's not the right thing to do. It's nice to have, uh, you know, an overarching kind of cool message for a campaign or whatever. But when you're talking to the small business owner about education, you're going to be talking about investment. If you're going to talk to a, 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 a new family with kids going into kindergarten, you're going to talk about empowerment. So it's just fine to do that. You, you'll find the, you, the values will be different on the person you're talking to. Let's just flip this whole thing upside down and pick one of those values of protection and see how that can also uh, apply to health care. Uh, it can apply to education, to infrastructure. We just had a bridge go down. Uh, you know, we, in Minneapolis, we had a bridge go down. And the government did, uh, did, had not checked the one gusset plate on that bridge that we had, and the whole thing went down. And uh, the inspectors didn't, didn't look at it, and the companies didn't either. So we need those kind of protections. And, um, and in, obviously, environment protection is a huge one. So what I'm getting at is the issue can go, one issue can go with lots of those values. Any one of those values can go with a lot of issues. This, uh, it, the more you think about that, the more it, I think it'll become easier to apply those values to messages that you have. Now you think about how that works. Um, and um, and this, this whole thing is just way easier than fact flinging. Um, and people don't like fact flinging. You go out and, and, and one big problem we have on our side is we do a lot of jargon, a ton of jargon. And, uh, and there are times I have no idea what somebody who's talking to me about is, is, is talking about. I, I can't figure it out because it, it's all brand new jargon. It's like, okay, what is it? You don't have to do that. Translate it into English. Christine was a, 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 a very famous uh, journalist with Scientific American. You, I, I, I know, I, I've, I've never read anything in Scientific American that wasn't written very well. So therefore, you must have been an extremely good writer there. And the whole thing is you can take complex ideas and make them simple for people. All of us can do that. So, but yeah, we we got to stop the fact flinging and reasoning. There's a place for that. There's people for that. That's what the good journalists are for. And uh, but it just doesn't work when you go out and do this for people. Their eyes glaze over. There's no science that shows that sitting somebody down and uh, lining facts up on a table and working them through your your impeccable reasoning is going to have any effect on change in their brain. If it's Einstein, maybe. Okay, and this is a huge bummer. 
to a lot of people. This is uh, this is the most pushback I get from people in our workshops. I'm going, dude, I'm with you. I would love for this to work. I really would. There's just no no evidence that it really does, unless the person is primed to think in that way. If they're scientists or they're uh, rhetoricians or logicians, you may have this possibility of getting through them. So um, anyway, doing this, you're literally building how we see the world, our perspective, our worldview, into people's brains with every message. And so talking to real people about what's right and wrong about an, an, an issue is having a moral conversation, and anybody can do that. I'm going to throw this in here because I couldn't find another better place to throw it in, but the bottom line in, in all the things about messaging, about messaging is that you are in charge. And remember that you are under no obligation. I changed that word in a different slide. But you are under no obligation to respond to your opponents or an interviewer's message. We seem to feel that because a Republican challenges us, we have to ask them. Heck with that. We'll show, we'll show you how to turn that around here. This is important very shortly. It's very, very important to do that. You just look at what they're saying and say, do I need to respond to this? And nine times out of ten, the answer is no. And if an interviewer asks you a question, you, you've seen politicians pivot. Pivot's the word that you hear a lot. And they'll just go to Stoke. No, I'm going to talk about this instead. Nancy Pelosi is like, she's like got the, got the jujitsu down on this whole thing. She knows exactly how to do it. She's a genius of not answering a question she doesn't want to answer. Uh, yeah, but the important point is you're not answering it because you don't want to amplify their stuff and you do want to talk about what you want to talk about. Maybe the Republicans are trying to drag you off to talk about another issue. Big one for them is cost of whatever it is you want to do. Reject it. Just reject it. I'm not going to go with this. You don't have, even have to say anything. You just go, you know, my view on this whole issue is, and now you go to your frame and your messages and the way you look at things. Lay it out for people. They can see it in that person-to-person, -person, real stories of real people, moral values way. And that resonates with people. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren, a while back, uh, in, in the presidential debate, must have been 2016, I think. Uh, uh, and she, so they asked about medical care. And, uh, and, and the, I think it was Lester Holt said, uh, well, would you have people give up the insurance that they like, the health the healthcare insurance that they like? And she goes, what do health insurance did companies do for us? What do they do? What do you benefit from as a citizen from health insurance? The only thing that the only people benefiting from the health insurance are the health insurance companies. Every other co country, every developed country on earth costs less and the outcomes are better. There's just no reason for them to exist. And she bumped 11 points the day after that. It was huge. And that's just putting it in perspective and putting it down to where, you know, you're not helping us. The insurance companies are hurting us. They're not protecting us. We're not, we're not uh, being fulfilled as human beings, those kinds of things. It's good to do. Okay, now let's, let's um, hit this this misinformation thing head on. Now, I'll give you one tool. You may have seen this before. It's out there in a, a few iterations. This is, this is uh, a take that I put on this, a small change, along with a friend of mine, uh, Hobart, uh, Lee Hobart Stocking, who's the best uh, environmental, if anybody's in environmental stuff, you got to read his website, skywaterearth.com. And Hobie's a wonderful guy. And uh, we were sitting around and we added this on. Uh, the, the truth sandwich. The concept is you, you, you layer the, uh, the uh, lie or propaganda that you're hearing. If you have to respond, if you, just, if you can't get out of responding uh, or if you can, and, you ha and you can't get off and do your own thing, then make a sandwich out of it. First thing you do is just state your values in the ways that we've been talking about. Then you call out the violation of those values by the, the people who, uh, by your opponent. Uh, when you do that, you indicate the lie or the propaganda without using their words and being very careful to stay out of their frame. They're, they are very careful to choose their words, and their words mean things to their people that maybe not to others. But uh, 
don't use their words to stay out of their frames. That gets a little tough, but you, you, you know, find a way to do it. And then, um, uh, and bonus points if you can put it in the form of a question. That's always handy. That's a great trick. Uh, and then, then say why what they're doing violates our values, how this isn't fair to somebody, or how that removes protections for somebody, uh, or how this can, can uh, take security away from people. Uh, and, then it, and then when you're done with that, go right back to our values and our message. So now, again, you pull this out when you really don't have much of an, uh, uh, an, an alternative to just reject their thing entirely and move on with what you want to do. Then you do this sandwich. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. And I'm getting close to the end, so you can have your questions and we can have a nice rousing discussion about that. Um, here's an example. Uh, Democrat, and I, I've really laid it on thick here. Just to make a point, uh, Democrats know that Social Security guarantees that all of us age with dignity and financial security. It was our right as citizens to create it, and it is our right to protect it from corporate greed. Why do Republicans want to take our Social Security and give it to Wall Street tycoons like they gave Medicare to the insurance companies? Why would they endanger retirees' dignity and security? Why don't, why do they think we don't have the right to protect and empower ourselves? Democrats will protect our right to protect ourselves by protecting and strengthening Social Security. All the blue words are our core values of protection, uh, security, and guarantee is in that security uh, idea. Dignity, citizen rights, uh, this uh, uh, power and strength. Uh, we are associating all these core value words with Democrats. And uh, we are building those associations in people's brains. It's, uh, psychology is all about associations. So, so do that. And uh, I'm going I'm to highlight one of these because we don't talk about it enough. In a democracy, at least for, for the next four or five months or so, uh, we, in a democracy, citizens are in charge. The buck stops with us. We're the ones who decide what happens. If we send somebody to Washington and they don't do what we want, we can vote them out, right? So, I mean, they're our representatives, but they're not our overlords. So it, it's our responsibility. And the Republicans do everything they can to try to make it appear that you don't have that power, that, that government has this power, and this government is other. It's not us. It's this other thing. And so they have gotten people to disassociate themselves from their own power. So I think it's really important and uh, to talk about our citizen power. We get to make the decisions. We can do that. And we don't talk about that enough. I think that's really important. That's a populist message if there ever was one. And I think you'll find that uh, the values we've been talking about, uh, these values are not alien to even MAGA people. They just don't apply them in politics or on a, the particular issue. So the, the nice thing about talking about our values is that pretty much everybody's got them in their lives. It's not like, the, you know, we're, we're speaking, uh, you know, Swahili or something. It's uh, this is something that, that they know. And so if you can get them, well, OK, I, I know what the protection is. How does that apply to Social Security? You know. You, you may not get them right then, but you planted a seed in their brain. Next time with their, they're with their MAGA buddies, they'll go, you hear what this crazy Democrat told me? Now, all of a sudden, they're propagating our message. You know, just the thought. Um, so as we un, unpack this uh, a little further, without statistics, convoluted reasoning, or jargon, we explicitly said what moral good Social Security does for us, why we value it, and why only we citizens have the power to secure its future. In indicating the lie, we called out the violation of our values, we, and we caused some controversy. This is going to be our last big point. We caused some controversy by saying that Republicans are after our Social Security. And, uh, and we also got a few bonus points for using the, basically an analogy of how they already gave Medicare to insurance companies. Okay? And that people may be unaware of that. And uh, lastly, we did not speak from the cost frame or the government in, um, ineptitude frames that Republicans use. So we stayed out of that. And we repeated some of these core well value words a few times. The word protection is probably in there at least five or six times. 
and re repetition is important. Okay, so the last big deal is, so why create controversy? And you remember a slide we have, uh, we had before, but it's because we get to turn around the dynamic. Controversy baits Republicans into responding to us for a change. That puts us in charge, and they have to respond to us. And the new MAGA folks, they're not as trained as the Carl Roves and the Dick Cheneys and the Frank Luntzes and the New Gingriches of the past. They're, the, the Republican Party has been entirely taken over by a different group of people. Those people are gone. Some of them are like ghosts hanging around like, like Liz Cheney, who still you know, has a semblance of, uh, of, of, of a brain to speak from. But anyway, we call it, causing controversy is very key to what we're doing. This is our last big concept. Because when we create controversy, we set the agenda of what gets talked about. We set the frame of discussion, which restricts what gets talked about, how it gets talked about, puts boundaries around, the boundaries we want around it. We intentionally provoke them into arguing and debunking. That amplifies our message, especially in social media posts like, did you see what those crazy liberals said and, or did today? And we made them take our bait, which kept them off their message. So basically, that's why we call what our project the Turnaround Project. It, it's about time we stop being the nice guys. I'm not asking you to go out and lie. I'm not asking you to use propaganda techniques. The propaganda techniques are evil. They are have an intent to deceive. You can use psychology f with honesty and integrity and do a real good job of it. And if, you, if, if you're worried that it's manipulation, I'll just put this in front of you. Every time you open your mouth, a message comes out. Right? You're going to use words. Those words are going to light up brain cells in people's heads. If you, uh, it, all that really matters is if you're speaking honestly and with integrity, and the words that come out of your mouth, do they help us or do they help the Republicans? Are we doing what they want us to do or are we doing what we want to do? So that's really important. The very last point, you have precious few minutes at the door or in a debate. Responding to Republicans' absurdities takes away from the time we should be on our message. Um, and we've talked about how you can counter that misinformation in a way that offers our perspective. And think about your audience. The audience is not the MAGA dude. It's not, it's not the, the MAGA shaman, right? You're never going to get that guy. I mean, unless you have deprogramming and you've got, you're have got you with him for another decade or two. You might turn him around. Some people do. Some people have. We've seen it. But that's not who you're after. You're after the people who are watching you talk with this guy. So if you're, on, if you're a candidate and you're on stage and you're doing this, people are watching you and they're watching the other guy. And he's the, saying his message, but you're saying your message, and you're making more sense and because you're connecting with them on a level everybody can understand. It's not wonky, but that is emotional and moral and value-rich. Um, you're going to come out on top. That This is important. So uh, that's the last thing. I'm, I think I'll shut up and let you I, I threw a lot at you. So who's got questions? I'm going to stop sharing here, too. Okay, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, first, let me say thank you, George. And um, you've given us a lot to, to think about. Um, but of course, uh, we're also very concrete people. So I think um, uh, being as concrete as possible um, helps. Uh, I mean, for example, and I think I gave you this example when we were talking, Jasper, who is on this call, and I were part of a group who were petitioning uh, on West 57th Street, and a MAGA dude um, uh, actually um, zeroed in on Jasper and, um, and said, uh, you should be thanking the cops who, are, who happen to be standing over there, and you should be thanking them every day. You know, Trump went uh, fortunately, a police officer was killed in the line of duty um, recently, and Trump went to the wake, not the funeral, um, but the guy said he went, that Trump went to the funeral, and nobody else did. Well, no politicians were invited to the funeral, 
But of course, those are the facts. And so, you know, we shouldn't get into that. And um, I wish I had that quick wit. You know, I thought of it afterwards. I, I mean, I went up and stood next to Jasper and we just let the guy keep talking. But I wish I had said, and what about the cops on January 6th? Do you honor them? Do you stand with them? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Or is that still within the frame of Democrats don't honor cops? Uh, it, it, it may be still in that frame, uh, but uh, you can still talk about cops and maybe turn it around. You can say, you know what? I, everybody in this city felt horrible when that cop died. That's a terrible thing that's happened. Think of his family. You're starting to get personal. You're telling a story. You're, uh, think of how they felt with this. You're dealing with emotions. This, this, is, this is not good for the cop. It's not good for this city. Um, and uh, I support police. I support police doing their jobs. That's a great thing. You're not saying that, you know, I don't know, I don't know the specifics of this. I don't know if this cop had been mistreating somebody. Or, I mean, I'm in Minnesota. We had Derek Chauvin and George Floyd, you know, just a few miles from here. Um, you know, it was a little easier at that point to then say, you know, uh, Chauvin's in jail and he should be there. He killed that guy. And that's terrible. Think about think about all of the hell you put this city through and all these people. And you're just giving your perspective and how you felt about it and and what you value. And, and you say, and how, however tragic that is, what's come about is we have more protections now. We've empowered uh, the police department to use mental health professionals to go out and 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 uh, help with a lot of this. In my city, violent crime has gone down to the lowest number it has ever been. It, after we instituted this, instituted having uh, mental health professionals able to come out and deal with people, that's a true story in my in my town, and so that's something I can talk about. I'm not quoting statistics. I'm not trying to poke the guy. I'm telling him how I feel, and it's different. But I also have had the same thing happen. I can't tell you how many times, even today, with all of what I know about this, that I go, "Oh, it would have been great. It would have." <laughs> uh, so. It happens. Okay. Questions. Or comments. Or comments. You know, a scenario that you were in recently. Um, I see Adrian says, great reminder regarding the audience. It's the people watching. Yes, go ahead, Dan. Hey, uh, thank you so much, George. This was super helpful. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me, uh, and I feel like it was kind of a low point for Democrats with messaging is like defund the police. Um, and I have a lot of people, you know, like uh, who are kind of more moderate or conservative Democrats, like uh, say things about that to me. Is it good to sort of like, you know, I was thinking about other ways to reframe it while you were talking, you know, like, wouldn't it be great to have like, medical, you know, or uh, mental health professionals support the police, you know, and uh, things like that, like uh, that, like sort of play into that protection thing. But is it good to like acknowledge or like distance ourselves from those statements like defund the police? That's a really, really good question. Something that we, uh, you know, again, dealt with here in Minneapolis in a very close personal way. In fact, one of my one of my best friends is uh, was a city council member in Brooklyn Center where Dante Wright was killed during the Chauvin trial. It was absolutely nuts. Um, defund the police. I, I rolled my eyes for a reason, because uh, it is not what we should be saying, because uh, and, and, and for one simple reason, which is I listen to people explain what they meant by defunding the police. And the very first thing out of their mouth is, well, it doesn't actually mean defunding the police. So, okay, well, then you have the wrong message if your message doesn't mean what you say. Uh, but I totally get seeing the, how, you know, how our community was ripped apart by this thing. Uh, I totally get why people were mad enough to say, that's it. Let's defund them and shut the police down. I mean, I, I get that, you know. Uh, and, but we can acknowledge that in other ways. I, I, don't, I don't think we should use those words. Um, I don't know that I'd correct somebody using it who's experienced these things personally, uh, but we can still talk about 
uh, you know, especially now, that there have been some some interesting projects. And so you can you can change the conversation subtly, subtly to say, you know, I, I heard this guy in Minneapolis telling me that in his city, they already did this with the mental health professionals and they have the lowest crime, lowest violent crime rate they've ever had. And so now you're, you've, you've sent this off in another direction and you haven't directly confronted the person. You haven't made them feel stupid or anything or wrong for for doing that it, it's it's a, you know in terms of framing and messaging it's just not a particularly good message the other one is democratic socialists nothing to do with what democratic socialists believe or anything uh it's just that the idea of associating the two words democratic and socialist together did not do us any favors at all it's a bummer that you know people can't call themselves what they want but by using those terms that just open the door for the Republicans to say, see, and they and they they believe that democratic socialists are everywhere in the Democratic Party, have taken the whole thing over. That's what they're going to say. But you don't want to do that. Now, the, the Europeans solved that issue by saying social Democrats, which is you know marginally better. But at least it's not democratic socialists, you know, so um, I, you know, it, it, I think the important point here is, is look carefully at the words. Think about, in psychology, they're called entailments, but think about the baggage the words have, you know. And uh, for anyone who's my age or older, you know, I grew up on World War II movies, of course, because I was born in 1955, 10 years after the war, right? Um, the word socialist was not a word people, <laughs> you know, they associate that word with other things that are different than what democratic socialists of America are, are associated with. So uh, anyway, sorry, I'm going on. Heather? Yeah, Heather, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Christine. And, and thank you, George. Uh, I just, this is a practical question. So a few weekends ago, I was not be on board and we, I met a woman who within maybe four minutes told me about three deaths she had had. Our conversation went to healthcare and so forth and so on. And so, you know, I found out a lot about these different issues and she was a Democrat and she started to express how she really felt and in terms of what Democrats and Republicans should do. But here's my practical question. How long do you let that kind of conversation go on before you pivot to kind of nailing down, like, are you going to vote for so-and-so or whatnot? Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I wondered about that because I was like, I think I let her go on a little too long. Democrats wanting to talk a long time? <laughs> what? <laughs> When's that ever happened? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's 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 less a messaging question than it really is. How, how do we deal with somebody in a gentle way and show that we're listening we care about what they're talking about but also knowing in our our minds that this person is not going to stop unless we stop them it's going to go on and so uh one thing you can say you know this that's really interesting what you have to say i have learned a lot today i i really have i gotta run to the i wish i could stay here i gotta run to my next thing but you know by the way I'm sure then, because of all of what you've spoken about, and you said you're a Democrat, I'm sure you'll be supporting Joe Biden and congressman and senator, whatever uh, kind of thing. So uh, that's one way to do it. Um, I was going to say something else because my aging brain, it just flew right out of it. Now maybe it'll come back to me. We had uh, uh, Roberta Gelb, who's the president of a, a neighboring political club in, in Chelsea, talks about uh, when she does phone banking, um, she says to, to uh, voters, I'm a breast cancer survivor, and that's why I want you to vote for, you know, whoever. And, and she says, it's amazing how, how people don't hang up on her. because, <laughs> And it, it's also true, but I mean, it's like, it, it, but it, she intuitively is doing what you're saying of, of making it personal and also about values that, if if you vote if you vote for Democrats, you're protecting my health care and your health care. And if you don't, you know, I'm not going to live, and you may not either. Kind of is the implicit message. There, there's a similar uh, situation with veterans. Veterans can be very effective messengers. They show up with the hat, you know, with the ship on it, uh, with the ship they served on. And uh, veterans can be very persuasive and people are not, you know, generally not going to give a veteran a hard time. 
Uh, and I know what I wanted to say. Um, uh, stories like that are powerful. Who gets to tell that story? That This is an important question, especially if you're a candidate. Uh, my rule has always, what I counsel candidates, is that if if the story happened to you, you can tell it. If a family member, somebody very close to you, your best friend, you can tell it. That's, uh, you know, one person removed. But um, if, if you're telling the story, you know, so the person you had, you spoke to, Heather, um, you could ask her, can I, can I, mention your story i don't have to mention your name but can i mention your story and they may give you permission but the thing you don't want to do is is somebody tells you that their uncle has a story you know that you don't want to do as a candidate you want to you want to have first-hand information as to where that story came from and you want permission that's really important or you're going to end up like reagan and you're going to tell the fictitious story of the welfare queen with the uh, mary Kay cadillac you know. Anybody else have questions, comments, or anything? We're 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 gonna we're planning on doing our uh, our in-person workshop, our three-hour workshop, uh, probably in July when everybody's out door knocking anyway, and they're not going to want us coming to town to do these things. Uh, we're going to probably do these online, and we can let you know about that. It's a it's a really good workshop. It's the same thing we're doing in the states. And um, and uh, we do occasional webinars. We've been so busy going to the states, we have haven't done as many webinars. But those are free. Antonia's Substack is free. Although I highly encourage you to subscribe. And um, uh, uh, you know, and then if you can donate something to that effort, uh, it's it's re once you read it, you'll see why. And um, uh, other than that, I want to thank Liz Keefe who was the person who connected uh, Christine and I. Liz Keefe has been coming to our uh, webinars for a few years now, and it's always just a treat talking to her and learning about her experiences. She seems to be quite the powerhouse in New York, so that that's great. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that she connected with me with you guys. Yes, thank you very much, George. Um, uh, should we get all candidates to shoot their 14-year-old puppies? Would that help? Is that a question for me? <laughs> yes, yes. We can't talk about that because my one of my corgis is like right here. Oh. Here's stuff. <laughs> but it is, it, I mean, it, talk about values. It, it does sometimes make me wonder if the cruelty is the point and how do we um, counter that? But um, by pointing out, it doesn't, I mean, when you point out the cruelty, it, it often seems to backfire. Yeah, I would almost say, you know what, I, I gave to the ASPCA or, or the our local shelter to and, and our dogs are shelter dogs. I really like dogs. Mm. Leave that hanging there. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else you can really do with something that stupid. I mean, you really normally just want to change the subject and go to something else because, again, she's doing this on purpose. She's signaling to people who live on farms that she's not afraid to take down an animal. She, you know, and she's even said as much. That's not what people on, people on farms don't shoot puppies, you know, for, you know, but uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, last chance to ask George uh, a question or make a comment. This is, uh, God, you, are you guys really New Yorkers? New Yorkers talk all the time. <laughs> Hands, I know this. How do I? Oh, my hand. Richard, go ahead. <laughs> You're on mute, Richard. You're on mute. How are we doing now? Perfect. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice to us on how to motivate our base. Uh, in New York City, we're not really surrounded by a lot of people with radically different views from ours. Um, but we, it, it's easy for people to get complacent in the city. Oh, we're all the same here. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to work. Um, it's all good. So any words of advice? I'll put on my organizing hat of being Excellent. a congressional district chair and involved in my party for a while. Here's something that worked in my congressional district that I think was the biggest way that we got people into the party 
and um, and that uh, made us strong. Actually, our congressional district generally is tops in the nation for voter turnout and voter contact numbers. And um, uh, and so, but what and I think that a lot of that's because we built a good ground game. What we did, there was one woman uh, who went to Camp Wellstone with me, which was a training thing put on by the people who worked for Paul Wellstone before he died. And um, and her thing coming out of that, she we all had to do a thing. Her thing was she was going to get uh, a series of speakers to go to like pizza joints and hang out. And, uh, you know, they were judges. They were college professors. They might be somebody who'd written a book. And invited invited Democrats just put something in the paper saying, "Come meet Democrats and hear hear so and so speak about this issue." And people started showing up. We didn't ask them to door knock. We didn't ask them for money, you know, just hang out, eat pizza, drink, have a beer, and listen to this person. And this went on. You know, we started. Uh, she started it right after, like like in December after an election, and in that uh, off year. Uh, she got a lot of people to come to these things. And then it gets really, really hard after they've come to these for like a year or six months for them to say no. When you say, you know what, you know, I've been listening to what you're saying. You're, you're, you, uh, you look like somebody who really could help us out. we got something going on. Would you help us with this? It gets really hard for them to say no. And a lot of those people just loved it. You know, they liked being called in and they go, you know, I haven't volunteered, but, you know, I think I will. There's, there's one idea. Is just keeping that kind of thing going, and uh, and a great way to do that is to do a messaging thing. Messaging to you know do some kind of training on that, you know start it out by saying why does democratic messaging suck? We'll answer that question tonight at seven. <laughs> Jackie, you have your hand up. Oh, you're muted, Jackie. You're muted. Still muted, Jackie. Uh, we now have an issue with young people with um, their protesting about the um, uh, issue of Gaza. And this was a group that we were so hoping was going to help us with their votes in the fall. So uh, when we're approaching and young people who, you know, might feel strongly about this issue, uh, how do we remind them of all the other issues there are um as well as the one they're interested in that's a really good question i don't know that i have a great answer for it um uh because it's such i mean it's it's a difficult issue it's it, you know uh people on all sides of this issue all have legitimate uh reasons for their positions um uh they're not always protesting if you know them personally. You know, if you can invite them to something else, just get them out of the situation for a while. Um, I, I am afraid we're going to lose the most uh, vehement protesters, not because they don't know that that Trump would be worse, way worse than Biden, but because what happens when people get really, really mad is they will just turn it on, they'll pick it out on somebody and it'll be Biden. And I, I worry about that. I think we may lose the support that we have, that we've gained from suburban women and and women even in rural areas, especially if you live in Idaho. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I think we, we will, uh, at, as we have gained people, I think we're also losing people there. I hope it doesn't go uh, uh, too much worse, but uh, it's not looking good out there. Like I say, if you know people personally, just say, you know, there's this other thing going on. I really like you to go with me to this and just get them out of it for a little while so that they they're reminded that there are these other issues. I mean, I think they know it, but I, I, I'm not the best person to answer this. OK, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, today's Wall Street Journal had an editorial and the Wall Street Journal is completely anti Biden anti-Democrats, and I just want to read the first paragraph short and the last line. The, the headline is, The Outside Agitators on Campus. Universities across the U.S. are finally inviting police to clear out protesters violating school rules. But that's not the end of the story. 
Recent days have shown that the protests aren't merely bursts of student moral concern about Gaza. They're often guided by a professional leftist group exploiting students to format chaos and intimidate President Biden. This is the Wall Street Journal, which never could say anything positive about a damage. And the very last line of the article says, the protests are running campaign ads for Donald Trump. I rest my case. Yeah. One thing Republicans do, Wall Street Journal included, is they project what they're doing. Those leftist groups that are outside leftist groups, I'll almost guarantee you are outside rightist groups. Yeah. In Minneapolis, when the George Floyd uh, thing, you know, protests were going on and then there was rioting that started, there were guys in pickup trucks from out of town running around. Some of them had guns. Uh, they were obviously, you know, uh, not living in that part of Minneapolis. And some of them were going around smashing windows and doing other things. The protesters were in general, generally rather uh, rather peaceful considering. But then they said, well, we can change that just by going and breaking a few windows, starting a couple fires. And so they did. And um, uh, the, yeah, you got the Republicans project what they're doing. They they tell you what they're doing by what they're accusing us of doing. That's terrible, Kevin. You know, when you see a major paper like Wall Street Journal, I mean, they've always been right leaning, but when they do stuff like that, it's just terrible. Mm. Shameful. Well, thank you so much, George. And if you have a, a moment, um, I actually see our city council person on the Zoom. And I don't know, Eric, how much of, of the messaging uh, you heard, but um, uh, I know you're always messaging and, and uh, sharing values with us. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to have that presentation. I think we need to take him on a road show and uh, all over all to all the clubs because we're all going to be on doorsteps. And even though they say don't spend time with people that you need to persuade, we are going to have to do a bit of that, aren't we? That's what strategic messaging is. Otherwise, we're just yeah. tacking, we're just messaging for today. And we don't change minds and we don't get our worldview out there. So how the heck would people know why they should vote for us if we never tell them, if we don't do that over time? Uh, a roadshow sounds like a great idea. We've already been talking to the Georgia State Party, and uh, they want us to do four or five cities in Georgia. So, uh, you know, that's a if you if you you have pull with the Democratic Party by any chance in New York, uh, be happy to do we that. We know them, yeah. Now I got a cousin in Brooklyn. I got another out on Long, another few cousins out on Long Island. Um, a former New Yorker myself, always happy to go there. I love New York. How can you not love New York? New York. How could you not, except in the winter? <laughs> Minnesota, believe me, going there is like going to Florida. <laughs> I was going to say Minnesota winters are, um, are are famous, aren't they? They're not like they used to be. This norm, this winter, I mean, we we get a good, at least a good solid month of you know zero or below, and like we did, we had like a day or two, and otherwise it's been in the forties and fifties, which is absolutely nuts that this climate change thing is really real for us. It's nice, <laughs> but the fires are terrible. What you in New York, you, the, we were, we were there when the fires uh, were going on and it was pretty terrible in New York. It was just like it was in Minnesota. So, anyway, once again, thank you, George. Thank you very, very much. And I hope we can continue, uh, uh, the conversation and, uh, uh, information on when to do the next webinar or the training. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks. And it's a privilege to speak with your people tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, since we have Eric uh, on the call, um, Eric, uh, we were mentioning earlier, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, we were uh, talking about um, a couple of things that have come up. Um, one being, uh, um, the unlicensed weed shops, and when do you think, have you heard 
when the city is going to have more authority to, to padlock the illegal ones. And then a number of people uh, on the call have emailed me or talked with me or and, and others about um, uh, the uh, vote on uh, changing the, the zoning text on uh, gaming facilities. So, um, you know, we can yeah. talk about this now or talk about no, it. No, we'd definitely love to answer any questions anyone has. With respect to the uh, hot shops, I was um, uh, just on the phone with the mayor's office earlier today asking uh, again for a more concrete timeline. I also spoke to the, the sheriff um, and I said, I actually said to him, I bet you didn't think this is what you'd be when you became sheriff. This is what, what you'd be spending most of your time on. He said, you're right about that. And I'm told that they are um, with this new authority that the state has granted they're in the process of putting together the, the policies and procedures that they'll use to padlock these places. And I um, am told to expect something like in the next couple of weeks. I had hoped that the budget would pass and that like the next day they could go and start throwing padlocks on these places. But apparently if there's a little bit more involved, but um, I spoke to Gail about it. We're both, you know, Gail, we're both anxiously awaiting the, um, some action because if you remember in last year's state budget, they announced some policies with great fanfare and you know, we at the city council passed legislation to make it illegal for landlords to rent knowingly to a pot shop and we announced that with great fanfare so i think people at this point it's like we just want to see the padlocks on the on the doors so i am gonna like blast out a whole email thing when we find out to my list because um, people, including me, are, are very anxious to see these things start getting padlocked. Okay. Um, oh, Jasper. And I saw Jasper had a question. Yeah, Jasper, um, are you, you need to unmute, Jasper. I had a question, like they have A ratings for restaurant. Why don't they have some type of designation for the legal cannabis shops? They all kind of look the same. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. I guess the question would be, what would you be grading them on? Since in a restaurant, it's like Department of Health cleanliness and stuff. It's a really interesting idea and something that once we get this thing going, maybe the state could take a look at that. I think... At this point, um, they can't even manage to like do anything right, let alone a letter grading system. So let's, okay. Maybe let's get to that later, but I think it's not a bad idea at all. Okay, I see all right. Alita, you have a question. Well, I just wanted to respond to Jasper. Like uh, this, this uh, any anyone who knows me knows that my um, issue around these weed shops has been I've vocalized it a lot. Um, there's a huge difference between a legal weed shop and the illegal weed shops. The legal ones are discreet. You have to show your ID at the door. They scan your ID into a computer. You go inside a place and you are met by a person who works there and they talk you through. It's very, it's like going to the doctor's office. It is not like walking into a deli where there's chips and candy bars and nobody looking at IDs at all whatsoever, let alone to check if you're 21. Um, mm -hmm. I personally am flabbergasted that our government has to find ways to regulate this and to shut them down when, um, you know, a restaurant that's operated for years and years and years with no issues forgets to file their liquor license 
and is shut down immediately for months. Yeah. Well, make that make sense. But yeah. when it comes to a grading system for a WeChat, like well, it's not, it's not a great, it's, yeah. it's not a grading system. It's just a matter of identifying as a legal entity. It's, it's not an A, B, C, D. It's just this is a certified New York State well, cannabis shop. Actually, actually have those. There is that. that is. There's very much that. And, and there should be really like no mistaking an illegal shop from a legal one. So if you have a question about whether a place is legal or illegal, it's illegal. Because right. you wouldn't question a legal shop. So, yeah, I mean, like I see bar... I see a guy on, I see a place on 42nd Street near it's the illegal. bus stop just off of 9th. <laughs> it's illegal. And they have a doorman out there in the whole bit. I don't know if it's uh, legal or oh, not. Oh, the one on you uh, know, So anyone second. can. Yeah. They're... No, they, some of them might check your ID, but it's not legal. Yeah. It's not. Um, The other issue, so Eric. Let me just say one more thing. Oh, there's, sure. there's usually door two doors you'll have to pass through to get into a legal weed shop there's the first so door it has entrance. to do with the construction of the building it has to have no two it's doors just i don't know if this bump. is part of their license but you'll have to why I, I think i've only been to two here in new york and i've been to them in other states but you have to go through a first entrance and it it's not it's like a like you're at a reception and it's then like going into a nightclub you, right then you buzz you into the official place yeah. So you're not just walking in and then there's weed everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think it would be interesting if the state would, uh, if they um, give a license to someone, there's a little insignia that says. Okay. Yeah, there, you is, know. there is an insignia. There is a decal for licensed shops. Um, going to there the is. Other issue is the, um, the zoning text amendment. Yeah. Why don't and I give an update on that? And um start by saying that next year or whenever this process starts you're going to see the most public um the most uh um opportunities for community input the most uh forums and presentations and uh uh surveys and you name it that, that any land use action that I don't think any of us are ever have ever seen. And that's going to happen through the approval process that the state designated when they, uh, when they, they voted to issue these licenses years back. The main difference between the, the, state process well there's a few main differences one is with the state process it's all of the elected officials so my colleagues and i with a ulerp it's just me deciding the other main difference is that in the state process there's no uh official role for the community board they're silent on community boards because community boards are not all over the state. In the city process and the ULERP, there's an, an, an advisory opinion from the uh, community board. So I'm going to add that community board piece in to the state process and require that any applicant, that all the applicants go to the community boards before the state process begins, at the beginning of the process, present to the community boards, meet with the community boards, have public hearings with the community boards, and then have the community boards issue detailed recommendations and weigh in just like they would in the Euler. And then on top of that, this state process with all the, the hearings and the presentations, et cetera, it's going to have a huge amount of community input. And at the end of the day, um, it'll be the elected officials making the decision. The, the gaming licenses are 0% are more likely to happen than they were before. The only difference is we're going with the state 
process instead of having the the ULERPs and you have my commitment that there's going to be more community input than any land use action that I don't believe any of us have ever uh, participated in. Eric, I, people have been saying to me that um, they they don't understand, they feel like they weren't heard, that uh, particularly since Community Board 4 was so um, vocal on uh you know, the idea of giving away um, power and accountability in a process uh, that has been around since the 1970s, I understand it. The other question I have heard people ask is, okay, so you're committed to community participation, but as we know, um, things take a while and it, and who, how, what guarantee is there that the next person on city council for district three will also be committed to community participation? It's, it seems like it's, um, uh, you know, a, a one-off situation and we've had a few issues like that between, you know, changing from one city council person to the next where they have different emphases. This Those wouldn't two. apply to anyone else. It would only, what, what we basically, what the city council did was open for this, for open a window of time to allow the state process to happen because the state process could not happen. So what the city council said is, okay, for this window of time, this very this very specific window of time, this this process can happen. So it's not going to affect any other anyone else any time in the future. And um, I don't. I would never support anything that gave up power or uh, accountability. And it was going to be. It was. It's at the end of the day. It's going to be like the elected officials are going to make the call. And the question is how, what we need to do. And this is my, this is my commitment. And this is my priority with, with something as important as this and something as consequential as this, the, the community deserves to see the presentations find out what, what we're even talking about here, ask the hard questions and weigh in and make their voices heard. And then at the end of this process, after we collectively as a community discuss, the elected officials will make the decision. Do I think it's a, a long shot? Yes. But the community deserves the opportunity to see the presentations to find out what the proposals are and to make their voices heard. Um, there's been no loss of community input. And because I, I, it's very important to me, I value it a great deal. And uh, so that's my commitment to you. And this is a, a very unique, probably once in a lifetime, circumstance with these uh, things, with these applications. And it's kind of like a quirk, a quirky thing that the state specified a process that couldn't happen in New York City unless we allowed it to happen. The Western Rail Yard site, that is going to go through a ULER because they're seeking a rezoning of the agreement that was struck in the Western original Western Rail Yards agreement. Um, but happy to answer any and all additional questions. Jackie, go ahead. You need to unmute. So um, giving these um, uh, real estate companies and their, you know, their partners, a chance to do their presentations is like giving them free PR in my view. Uh, with all of their presentations, 
is anybody going to do a presentation to oppose them? Uh, Liz Kruger, as you know, just recently had a great town hall and there were some great speakers who gave the opposite viewpoint. So I think we need to hear, you know, we need to give PR on the other side and not just let SL Green and, you know, Rock Nation and all of them do their little song and dance. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's like with any land use application, the applicant comes forward and presents the, you know, moonbeams and shamrocks and and hearts. And then the the community asks the hard questions and ferrets out the details. And that's why getting out the transparency the the openness the getting it all out there in that very open way and letting everyone of all the different viewpoints give their piece and say their piece so people get a total uh, a panoply of opinions and hear both sides okay Alex, go ahead, unmute yourself. Sorry, just unmuted myself. Um, my question for you, Eric, is um, what uh, state agencies will be overseeing these meetings and when and where do you foresee that they will be taking place? It's called the, the Gaming uh, License Citing Board or the Gaming Location Citing board. It's an entity that was created to um, administer the citing process of these licenses. And um, we will get to have input into where they take place, but they'll they'll take place probably they're thinking that like sometimes next year. Uh they'll take place. They, they, they don't want to start the process until all the, they know exactly which applicants there will be. And for the, like Western rail yards, for example, they would need a, uh, to rezone the Western rail yards and get the approval before they were even allowed to be part of the process. So that Western Rail Yards ULERP is going to happen and those meetings are going to start soon. And then at the end of that, um, sometimes next year, they'll, they'll resume this process or it could even be delayed again. I mean, it's been delayed. Um, I was talking to Liz Kruger about this yesterday and we're just like, you know, it's just like dragging on painfully. Because you mentioned there would be a tremendous amount of community input and um, people would have the opportunity to voice uh, their opinions on this matter. So I'm just trying to get a more specific understanding. Uh, I mean, I know you said it still needs to be ironed out and the dates haven't been established yet, but I'm just trying to get a rough draft of yeah. what kind of um, input will I'll be allowed to present and when and where you anticipate or foresee this taking place. And the good news is we can require as much as we want right? As the deciders, we could say, we're going to have, we're going to do it this way, this way, this way. We're going to hear from the public this way, this way, and this way. And whereas a ULER has um, one public hearing at the city planning commission, and one public hearing at the community board, at the, at the, uh, at the city council, we're going to have quite a bit more than that. Okay, you mentioned any other questions? Um, you mentioned uh, the Western Rail Yards um, possibly being renegotiated. Um, and I know you're a, a strong proponent of uh, middle income housing, and yet it seems like Related is trying to um, uh, Build more office space and not as much residential. At least that's what I what we read in West Forty Second Street. Can you speak to that and what you think of 
the the um, middle income housing that had been part of the Western Rail Yards agreement. Yeah, they want to re. They want to change the agreement, the the original zoning that was made during the Bloomberg administration, when it was uh, prescribed to be nearly all residential with a little bit of commercial. And they want to uh, flip the um, ratio and have mostly commercial with some residential. And the the original zoning was gonna be um, all market rate condominiums with like 1600 affordable units. And what related is saying is that they want to build just the affordable units, the 1600 or, or whatever affordable units, and not build any other residential, but make that commercial. And that is um, uh, uh, going to be, it's going through a ULIP process. And we're going to be meeting with Community Board 4 about that. And just like any other Euler, we're going to put it out there to the community. I've I've heard uh, really no one in favor of it yet. Um, but we need to have this um, process where we go through the Euler process and and hear from any everyone about what they think about it and make a decision at the end of that process. I take land use processes very seriously. And <laughs> uh, Alita, I take land use processes very seriously. And I go into them with, um, with uh, every decision, with an open mind, hear the facts, Evaluate the facts, hear from the stakeholders, study the issue carefully, bring in the experts, and collectively with the community, make a decision at the end of that process so no one can say that they, their proposal wasn't considered fairly. No one can say that we didn't have a professional deliberative process. And we appreciate you coming here to to talk with us, Eric. Um, you're always, uh, you know, willing to talk, and and that's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, there, there is definitely access. Um, Thank you. Are there any other questions for Eric? I I note it's eight thirty nine, and and uh, we we went a little over a lot of talking. Democrats like to talk, I hear. Uh, I'm in Central Park after dark, like our Garfunkel said not to do. Yeah. Good. Could you have Eric talk about May 7th? <laughs> May 7th. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big party. Oh, my birthday? Yeah, there we go. You remember yeah, that? <laughs> yeah. Um, next Thursday, May 9th. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Um, if you all haven't gotten the invitation, I would love to see you all there. I'm turning 32. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll be turning 45. And uh, it's at the Yotel on 42nd and 10th. I can't believe I forgot to talk about that. I uh, I, should, I need to get better at that kind of stuff. Um, uh, please come. It's not a fundraiser unless you want to give an optional contribution but it's just a party and um daniel won't be in town that stinks um but i would love to see you all there you only turn 45 once right and that's on the 7th or the 9th um it's on thursday the 9th okay and I'll, I'll find the link and put it yes thank you jasper i'm gonna find the link and put it in the chat here uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting uh we're getting comments that some of us have turned 45 a couple of times already <laughs> it's young i realize that it's young you know i used to seem like a 
like 45 was so old, but now I, I, I do recognize that it's, you know, 45 is the new 30, I think. No, 45 and 45. Don't start that stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, we've probably, it's always good to, to end on a laugh. So um, uh, I think uh, this has been a great meeting. And um, thank you to uh, Eric. And oh, here is, here is the um, link from Eric. And yeah, please come. Yeah. And um, we'll be talking. Uh, there is, as I said at the top of the meeting, flower sale May 12th and 13th at Manhattan Plaza on the 12th and 13th at um, Hell's Kitchen Park. The uh, volunteer um, uh, are needed for that as well as for the Ninth Avenue Food Festival. We have the Simon Rosen Zoom coming up and I see Three hands. I'm going to go Ruby, Richard, and Heather. Um, being we don't have a meeting before June 5th, I wanted to let you all know that um, this old relic is going to be performing at the Whitney Museum on June the 5th at 7 p.m. with, with uh, four other uh, drag queens from the Legends of the Drag. Um, I think the tickets will be $10. I'll have a link on, on Facebook, so on which most of you are with me. So I would love to see you there because not very often I think it's get to perform it. What's the date, Richard? Fantastic. June 5th, Ruby Rims at the Whitney. Uh, be there. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Heather, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much, Christine, for that presentation and also for uh, saying about something about our outreach. And we're Monday, Wednesdays, 4.30 to 6.30. And we usually have a lot of fun. I don't know why, but we do. We go a little nuts. And I think that was a perfect presentation for that week. But I know, Richard, you want to say something. I just wanted to restate that we are <clears throat> commencing a membership drive. We will be having tables out. We will be posting times and places looking for volunteers and um, we're hoping to bring in a lot more members to the club. Thanks. And we'll be doing the voter registration and Shashank, are you still on to talk about that? Because we'll be doing that, you know, more of a focus. I don't know if he's on. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so yeah. much. Perfect. Uh, just want me to get straight into it. You know, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, but yeah, give me one second. Let's turn my camera on. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so for guys, the people here who don't know me. Uh, my name is Shashank. Um, I've been involved in New York politics for the past several years. I used to work for Congressman Carolyn Maloney as a field organizer in Hell's Kitchen and Chelsea. So I spent a lot of time in a neighborhood, getting to know the neighborhood and getting to know, you know, how it works. <laughs> but anyways, um, I've been doing that. I've been involved with the Manhattan Democratic Party, Manhattan Young Democrats for the past few years. I was on their board uh, for the past two years. And I'm now here, and I'm also uh, the political director for the College Democrats of New York. So I spend a lot of time focusing on young people, youth outreach, and finding out, thinking about different ways on how to really engage youth from like 16, all the way to like 15, 28 years old. So when it comes to Health Kitchen Democrats, you know, after speaking with Heather and uh, Richard, you know, I think we really thought, and they're down to around, I think, three different groups of people on how three main groups so we got like obviously high school kids college kids and even um young adults so young adults is from around um like what 20 21 to 28 uh college kids around like 18 to 21 and um high school around 16 to 18 or even even younger uh when we talk about like high school kids i think we're talking more um not really just to get them out to vote and voter registration obviously we could do like pre-voter registration for um for them, but also a way to really engage them in the neighborhood and not just Hell's Kitchen, but their neighborhood where because thing is a lot like a, a lot of you guys know, a lot of people uh people go to high school not from the neighborhood. And you know, really focusing on these schools. I think I got a list of like, for example, uh let me just pull up real quick. Uh Independence, uh Beacon, I mean High School, Park West, those are just a few um high schools we have in the neighborhood. Uh if we can really focus on do some type of outreach and you know um talk with me i know this is a terrible timing as well because school's gonna be out of session in like a month um however if we can really talk to them about maybe 
you know, having like high school kids, for example, come to our meeting and really learn how a democratic club works, how to really understand a neighborhood or, you know, connecting them with their democratic club where they might be from in like Brooklyn or Queens or, you know, wherever, something like that. Um, just really focusing on civic engagement with the youngest group of young people at the lowest level, that's going to be really beneficial, I feel like, and will pay off in the long run when they can actually come out to vote. And they will also be doing the same things that we're doing to the next generation and really creating generational political wealth, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's just one thing that we really talked about when it comes to high school kids. So when it comes to college kids, we have, I think, John Jay and Fordham Lincoln Center Day. That's kind of a little bit out of the district, but I think that's something we should really maybe think about uh, trying to target. Um, so obviously, I want to really... Uh, talk to some people at both of those colleges and see if we can get them, obviously, to maybe come to our meetings, learn about, like I said, learn about what what we do, how we can really engage college kids and how they can really start up their own chapters and official chapters for college Democrats um, at John Jay and Fordham, and at the same time, intertwine them with neighborhood issues and keep them engaged. Um, yeah, and then I'd say the hardest group that we really, we talked about is the young professional group, uh, which we can narrow down to more subgroups, such as uh, the act actors, theaters, and art, theater people and artists. I think that's the that's the best one that we really talked about that we can target the best uh, through like Manhattan Plaza and different buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, so really talking like also I think the theater unions and theater groups, um, and trying to get doing voter registration with them might be a very smart move. And if we start now, you know I think that'll be really good. And also we have like young professionals who work in finance, tech, and, you know, in corporate America, uh, they're all working in Midtown and a ton of them are coming from all over the country. They, they all live here for a year or two and they, they work um, in Midtown offices. You know, I think that might be the hardest group because I know uh, usually generally a lot of them come from a more conservative background and might also just not really care, you know, not, not totally care. And it would take time for them to really, you know, I guess, feel it feel engaged and be engaged with the neighborhood or even just politics in general um and you know i think uh one thing that we thought about on uh, targeting young professionals all together uh that 21 28 group is happy hours across the neighborhood i think a lot of people might like that one um along 9th avenue 10th avenue show up at these places and doing some voter registration around there talking to people about hk dams what we are and you know trying to incentivize, incentivize them to get involved with the club, just come out to the meetings and just be engaged with the community. So that's just a quick lots gist of, of what we got. Yeah, but yeah. Lots, lots of good ideas there. Um, and one of the things we've we've learned is to try to focus and pick one or two to start. So um, uh, you know, I love the energy, and um, I'm I'm looking at the time again and and seeing that we probably need to stop because we're also. Uh, but I love the energy, and I think uh, we're excited to to be working together. So um, thank you all. Keep uh, your eyes open for upcoming events and and news. And uh, and uh, thanks for coming this evening. Uh, thank you. Good night.